Dumbo, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and uh, was asked, invited by the old board of trustees to be the first president of the system and to set up a small community college uh, in the uh, old Henry Barnard School, which is the University Extension Building. And this came rather quickly in 1964, and we expected to, I was asked to begin with 200 students. Uh, by the, uh, I was appointed in April, and by the first part of May, we had 700 applicants. Uh, so it was really a needed uh, thing here. Fifty years of serving the state of Rhode Island, 50 years of celebrating education, of helping our students get to where they are in life, the differences that we've made, 50 years of really doing that. As we bury this time capsule in honor of those 50 years, I want to thank all of you that are here today, our students, our faculty, our staff, for making this an incredible community college for the state of Rhode Island. We're in this together, but I want you to think about what this college has done for you, what it means to you, and let's just spend a few seconds of reflection of a moment of silence to remember those that came before us, that started this institution for us, and why all of us are able to stand here today and reflect on that. I uh, was running for office in, for the first time as governor in 1962. I had a, a series of uh, programs and ideas that I wanted for the state, wanted to get the interstate highway system built, and the idea of a junior college had been discussed, uh, but nothing had come of it. And um, so I came in and just decided we're going to get this junior college going. Whereas in January 1960, the Rhode Island Junior College State System was established by an act of the Rhode Island General Assembly and closely followed the recommendation of a commission to study higher education which called for the establishment of a statewide system of junior college campuses with facilities in the Patuxent Valley, Blackstone Valley, and Mount Hope areas of Rhode Island. And whereas, from its modest beginning with 325 students in 1964, to its present enrollment of almost 18,000 students, the Community College of Rhode Island has grown to meet the goals of its founders. And whereas in every sense, Community College of Rhode Island strives to be Rhode Island's community college, meeting the educational needs of the people of this state. Now therefore, as governor of the state of Rhode Island, I do hereby proclaim November 12th, 2014, as CCRI Day in Rhode Island. Fifty years ago, Governor John Chafee and the state legislators had the vision to bring the community college system to the state of Rhode Island. Community colleges represented opportunity, a chance for everyone, no matter where you came from, no matter how much money your family had or didn't have, to further their education. For many, it was the first that anyone in their family had ever attended college. For many, it was a way out, a chance to better themselves and their family's future. Fifty years later, community colleges across the country still represent the same opportunities. Affordability, accessibility, open access to all and a quality education has always been and remains our true mission. So uh, we decided that we'd uh, open up in what what's now called the Foundry Building, the old Brown and Sharp Building on Promenade Street. And I took, I believe it was something like $150,000 from my uh, con governor's contingency fund to provide the money to get started. So this is the new entrance now, the Foundry. Well, it's called the Foundry, but then it was just called the old Brown and Chop, that's it. Wow, uh, what a difference walking in. My goodness, it, things have changed. <laughs> 
Well, it looks like an office building rather than yeah. a factory. If, you, if I didn't know that this was the building we had our classes in, I would never recognize it as being Rhode Island Junior College. Yeah, it looks it look just so like a regular office it's building. It's just so different. It was an old factory, barn and shop, real famous tool makers were here. The oil-stained yeah. floors. Those days really were incredible. In this building, while it looks far, far different than it did then, there's a lot of history, not only the history that dates back to the old Brown and Sharp, but how we were able to walk in and in walking in, take an old factory and gradually just change it. We operated out of our briefcase, no file cabinets, no desks. Uh, I kind of wondered uh, what was I getting into, but I figured I'd give it a, a try for a year and uh, I think within a very short period of time, the enthusiasm uh, that I think we all had at the beginning, uh, I think it, it started with, with Bill Flanagan and just kind of went out to all of us. And uh, I think that, that beginning and that excitement that we had uh, at the start uh, uh, went a long way into the, the uh, development of, of the institution and the way it grew from its small beginnings. It was okay. It was just an old factory building, uh, small hallways, small rooms, uh, high ceilings. It was dusty. Uh, nothing what I thought a classroom would be like. <laughs> I remember it was kind of a fun building, nooks and crannies everywhere, and it was just kind of funky and kind of met so many people from all over the state, and that was, you know, that was good about it. It didn't matter about the building. It was about teaching the, the students. Well, there really wasn't a campus. I mean, you, there, you know, there was a factory. The feeling I had was family. It was very much like you, we all hope for within a family that is supportive and interested in your future in a loving and a caring way. So that's, that's truly what, it was an extension of your real family. Everyone was very supportive, straight across the board. It was like a little diamond in the rough. I mean, there wasn't anything like it. It, there, it was very, very new. What did the Providence Journal call us? Within six months of uh, Rhode Island Junior College being uh, in action, they called us the Miracle on Promenade Street. Yeah, but we were there. <laughs> No, no, this is it. This is it. <laughs> now it's, well, I'm back in college. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is, this is like what it used to look like. It's one stairway. We go, I'm going up a whole lot slower <laughs> than I used to back then. I used to run up and run down to classes so we wouldn't be late. <laughs> This doorway was pretty much here. It's not this particular doors themselves, but at least this doorway was here. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. This was a reception area, and then these offices were the, uh, the, the offices for the administration. This, I believe, was Dr. Flanagan's office. Bill Flanagan really was uh, marvelous. Uh, Bill Flanagan um, uh, just uh, took the bit in his mouth and ran. Dr. Flanagan was the first president. And Dr. Flanagan was a wonderful person. He was uh, at Mr. Community College or Mr. Junior College in those days. And we became very friendly and I had the highest of uh, regards for Bill Flanagan. I always looked forward to seeing him come to the Lincoln campus. That when you look at Dr. Flanagan and, and how he handled situations, he was, he was excellent, but he was a philosopher too. I think this college meant uh, everything to my father. I think it was a lifelong dream that he was going to be part of something that was going to be able to provide affordable education and opportunity for anyone who sought it, anyone who 
felt it. It didn't matter whether you came from privilege or whether you um, had came from a tough economic background. It didn't matter if your track record in uh, high school or your uh, your previous educational um, experiences were not great. You were going to get an opportunity at any age. What it really meant to him was you were going to be able to provide opportunity for everyone and uh, regardless of your background. I never met a man I respected more than Dr. Flanagan. He was very intelligent, very witty, very generous, wanted to do the best for the students that he, that he possibly could. He was the right man at the right time. I'll and never forget the first day of, of school um, on opening day. He, the way he spoke to us, he motivated us. Um, we were all excited and nervous, and, and he, just, he just made it seem as if everything was going to be great. And it was. It, it was. was. I remember so distinctly feeling as though we were pioneers. We were forging a direction in the state of Rhode Island, and I just got the sense from the very beginning that he, the administration, the faculty, and even the people in government were willing us to succeed. Well, the first day of school, all the students came in, and it was in the auditorium. Flanagan was there, and he kind of orchestrated the whole thing. He introduced the administration, Dean Turner, and Dean Boxtall. I think he introduced the faculty as well. And the students were all there, and uh, they were all nervous, and everybody was nervous. And Flanagan was very, very comfortable in that kind of element. He put everybody at ease. He told the students what an exciting experiment it was going to be. He encouraged the students to do well and said how lucky they were and we were to get this school off the ground. I think people were very excited to be part of it because it was so new and it was such a wonderful initiative. It really gave us the feeling that education was for everyone, which is a uniquely American idea, as Dr. Flanagan said in his inaugural address. But we all felt we had a seat at the table and that we, it was up to us. And Dr. Flanagan was a calming presence. He was really a coach. He was avuncular and he was pleasant and he encouraged and he always said just the right words that put us on track and made us feel we could do it. He told us that he, was, he couldn't guarantee that we would be accepted into four-year schools. And in fact, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. The four-year schools, many of them didn't want to take a chance on us because we were not proven. And he made that very clear in the beginning. But he also said, one thing I can guarantee is that in years to come, you'll ride by this school, maybe with your grandchildren, and you'll say, I was there, I was a pioneer. I was there at the very beginning. I saw it happen. My class began with 325 students selected from a pool of 800. Most of us were just out of high school and all of us were full time. In the fall of 1965, we were joined by an incoming class of 900, causing the college to balloon in size so much that it had to expand into converted factory space. Almost overnight, our classrooms were joined by laboratories, a library, a cafeteria, and a student activity center. My class and classes behind us were challenged, inspired, and nurtured by CCRI's founding president, Dr. William Flanagan, and its unmatched faculty and staff. With their encouragement, we organized a college senate, a newspaper, a literary magazine, a basketball team, cheerleaders, a drama group, a band and glee club, a chamber of commerce club, and a student service organization. Our graduating class had a class ring, a yearbook, an alma mater, and a prom. It is no wonder that the Providence Journal christened our college the miracle on Promenade Street. Early in the year, some of the students, who was in his second year of operation at that point, uh, went to the dean and asked if they could have a basketball team. And there had been no thoughts or plans of anything about an athletic program. And so the dean came and asked me to see if I'd be willing to try and start a, a basketball team. And uh, I mentioned to him at the time I said, I'd be very happy to help out, 
but I really don't have the qualifications to be a basket, the college basketball coach. So I met with the students that were that were interested, and I agreed that you know I'd go ahead and try and start a basketball team, which in general was a unique opportunity because not many people get a chance to be in a position to start something when there's absolutely nothing there. There were no balls, no gyms, no uniforms, no opponents. There wasn't anything, just a, the group of people. And this is uh, 1965. But it turned out we, we put the team together. We, we uh, came up with a 17-game schedule. We won 11. We lost six, uh, which I felt pretty good, you know, for the, for, the, for the first year. Well, Title IX came in in 1972. There were no female teams before that point, and three girls from East Providence came in. They said, uh, do we have a volleyball team? And I said, no. Uh, why? They said, uh, they said, why don't you have one? I said, nobody ever asked for one. They said, well, we're asking for one now. I know that we were growing in Providence. Promenade Street was tough. We shared everything. Uh, I shared the lab, uh, my lab with the chemistry lab, so that meant every time I got ready to set up a lab, the chemistry people would have to take down theirs, but we also shared equipment because we didn't have a lot of equipment. I would go to the different hospitals and uh, look at the equipment they had that maybe they were going to get rid of and try to bring it over to the school so that we could teach the students. Uh, I know quite a few of the first faculty only because they were colleagues of mine because I was teaching in East Providence at the time and several people from East Providence were tapped by Bill uh, to help with the first faculty. And in the beginning, they all complained. It was terrible. I mean, the, the situation was chaotic. The materials and the equipment were not exactly up to snuff. And those original faculty members really paid the price for getting this place up off the ground. One of the things that always fascinated me on Promenade Street was parking. We supported the Providence Police Department. We supported them. They would just wait for our students to park and tag them. There was no parking down there. And we were given the gift of the property on the night campus with a couple, couple of stipulations. One, we build a college here. And two, which was so such a burden on the president, he had to live in the big house and maintain the mini farm that was there. I think my dad was a little humbled at the beginning that he didn't, um, he lived in Warwick. He came from the Appenog section. He lived in a house that um, his grandfather had built uh, in the, after the Civil War. Uh, so that, that home was very much home for him. And to take the long two mile journey all the way up Commonwealth Avenue, uh, up Tollgate Road was, was a lot for him. But I think it was more about, um, he felt a little, a little humbled that you know, you're going to move into this big, huge home with 20-something uh, odd rooms and things like that. My mom, on the other hand, who had five kids, she was very much in favor of moving at the time because it had a dishwasher and the kids could have their own bedrooms and uh, it made her life a little easier. When, uh, when we moved into the home, uh, one of the uh, things that Mr. Knight had wanted to do was to make sure some of his key staff were kept on. Uh, one of those gentlemen was Bob Jodry, who lived in a home on the property, which I believe is now a conference center. And uh, he was the caretaker for the grounds. Uh, it didn't take my dad long to find out that Bob was an incredibly bright guy, incredibly intelligent man, um, and also packed full of common sense. So he later became the uh, chief of building and grounds um, for the entire campus. He's one of the ones with Bob Henderson and others that really were the catalyst for the building of this particular facility. Well, the, the house and, and the estate itself was built in the 1830s by the Sprague family. The Sprague family was, the, um, was another big mill-owning family in the state of Rhode Island, and uh, they were heavily involved in politics. It was a very well-known name. They hit financial ruin in the 1800s, and then the Knights came in and bought a lot of their mills along with this property and then the Knight family moved in to the property and several generations of Knights lived here 
and worked it as they called it a gentleman's farm. Once the Knights bought the um, estate in the 1800s, it was only Knight family member, you know, successive generations that lived in the house and operated it as a farm. And in the last one was uh, Royal Knight, and he, in 1964, um, decided to deed what was left. By that time, he had already sold off the, the Rhode Island Mall portion of it, or someone previous to him had. And the, this side of Route 113, he deeded to the state specifically to build the community college. President Flanagan was, I believe, instrumental in, in the whole process as well, um, because they just had a very small number of classrooms on, in a rented building on Promenade Street in Providence. But this was a huge event back in the 60s for them to take this on. One day on Promenade Street, it was announced that we were building a new campus. And we had a field trip. They invited us out to the groundbreaking. I think it was, 19, I think, 1967. I think they come preparing a big field, some of the state dignitaries. I think it took five years to construct this building. In the meantime, Dr. Flanagan called me to a meeting. They were going to meet with an architect. They had planned a gymnasium. The gymnasium was one basketball court, pull the door across the middle, divide it in two. That, that, that was the whole thing. So we sat at the meeting, and afterwards, Dr. Flanagan said, well, what do you think? I said, my honest, I, my honest answer is that if that's all we can build, I wouldn't build anything. I, would, I said, I would save you money until you can build what you need. I said, if you're asking me, can I run basketball practices and play games there? The answer is yes. But what about the phys ed courses? What about the uh, wrestling team? What about intramurals? What about all of that? He said, good point. Go out and see what you think we need. So I started going to different places. People would direct me, this University of Maine's building a new gym. Someone else is building something else, and I would go there. Someone then directed me to Dick Thieber at Brown. He sat me down one day. He gave me a lot of time. He spoke to me about three or four hours. What an education he gave me. And I remember saying to him, Dick, I can't do this justice when I go back. Can I bring my development officer over here? He said, sure. So I took Bob Henderson, and we went over there. And we came up with the field house concept. And he convinced us and Bob that we could get a lot more space for the same amount of money by going with this multi-purpose field house. And our eyes kind of lit up at that because now we have, we have four basketball courts. We could also serve as four tennis courts. We could have baseball, could have infield practice on one side. They put up the batting cages. It could be used by everybody. And um, so we ended up, we ended up going with, with, with that uh, concept. And uh, it's still like buildings now 40 some years old and still it serves for graduation. Takes care, take, it, it takes care of, of, of all the sports. That was how the, uh, the field house got started. I watched them build uh, this building at the Ward campus. We used to come out periodically just to see them uh, digging and where they were as far as uh, the building goes. And it looked like a big ship. It was really different than the other types of buildings that we'd seen. Now let me ask you a question. How does the megastructure serve you? because well, during my period on the board, <laughs> there was great controversy about this building. Well, I imagine there was. Uh, I was very surprised uh, when I first uh, interviewed here uh, to see um, this megastructure in Rhode Island because my impression of Rhode Island uh, was that it was very old New Englandish, and that uh, a college campus would be all uh, little red brick buildings all over the place. And when I saw this uh, megastructure from Route 95, I couldn't believe that it, Rhode Island had bought into that kind of a concept. Well, it almost didn't. And I thought they must have had one heck of a salesperson or persons at the time. <laughs> so so I, may, I would imagine that that was Perhaps some debate. Vitally to political campaigns? <laughs> I'm just not sure. <laughs> Something how it happened. Happen here. Uh, we are going, uh, incidentally, to change this megastructure uh, dramatically in the next uh, two years with the addition to the building. We are reconfiguring 
I won't call this a monstrosity and out of respect to those who love it so much, uh, but uh, it's going to be totally new in a lot of ways. It's going to be much more uh, user-friendly. You'll be coming in on the bottom floor and the new entrances and that sort of thing. Former Governor Sunland, who uh, was very outspoken, of course, where he was shot down over occupied France during World War II. And every time he left this building, he'd say to me, Mr. President, he said, you need to show me how to get out of here. He said, he said I had an easier time finding my way out of occupied France than out of, <laughs> getting out of this building. Well, George Kelsey said that it looked like a battleship poised to go into Narragansett Bay. And as a matter of fact, after the plans had been developed and quite a bit of money had been spent on planning with Perkins and Will, the architects, George Kelsey came up with a new plan to scuttle this one and build what you have just talked about, a series of brick buildings with a center campus and ivy growing on them, a real New England campus. However, he did not prevail on the board. We said, we're going to go ahead with this. But you know, the interesting thing about this megastructure is that the students like it. They really do. This building was built in brutalist style, and it's not called brutalist because it's brutal, even if some people fought. So it's, uh, it came from French expression, uh, baton brut, which is poor concrete. So the whole building was uh, created or constructed as a mold and uh, the concrete was poured into it. This building is certainly um, a really interesting example of modern architecture and um, love it or hate it, it's here and it's very unusual and it's, it's something that um, we might as well appreciate. It won lots of awards in its time, so it was creative. And when you get in the building, it's pretty exciting. I mean, when you go up to the sixth floor and you get the views and the portholes, you get a sense that it's, it's a pretty interesting building. In the 60s, it was, uh, brutalism was a very popular building style. The cement structure is supposed to be looking like a ship from, from anywhere in the state where you can see it. You know, it looked like a spaceship that it still does now, but it was empty of all uh, humans, <laughs> except for the construction workers, so. Uh, this was touted as the great, uh, tw you know, building of the 21st century, when we were in the 20th century, and people came from around the world to see it. That was a, a big, big issue at the time. Uh, even today, you know, modern architecture is not so well thought of in many places in New England. I mean, we're still pretty stuffy here about that. But anyway, we engaged a firm, uh, Perkins and Will was the name of a very fine architectural firm, and they designed the building that we now have as the Knight Campus. You're familiar with it. There were many members of the board and members of the public also who, living in New England and enjoying New England campuses, wanted the campus to look something like Brown or Harvard with its ivy-covered walls. They just couldn't envision this kind of a modern building as being connected with higher education. But fortunately, we had a majority on the board who agreed to continue with Perkins and Will, and the, the uh, Knight campus was built as it was originally planned. I believe that we have stayed true to President Flanagan's mission described the college, and he described it the college in December of 1969, Interiors Magazine article about the design of the Knight Campus, and I quote Dr. Flanagan, it doesn't try to be a junior varsity imitation of a major university, but realizes its function and accomplishes it without being tied to the traditions of the big campus. It provides an environment for learning suited to the youth of today and the future. In a limited time, our students may be exposed to many fields of knowledge. Students will mix and be encouraged to search for learning to the limit of their ability. What a wonderful quote. You know, a lot of people look at it and they don't, you know, ooh, that thing, it's like, I think it's beautiful. There's something about it, can't explain it. But uh, I guess for what it represents, you know, that boat going east, you know, taking off. 
it was like going to the Taj Mahal. It was such a big building, and Promenade was so small uh, and quaint. Uh, the building here is like a Navy ship uh, in many respects, but not as nice, okay? Uh, and, and not as useful, because the Navy ship isn't hollow in the middle. <laughs> and uh, no, I've often thought, speaking of uh, things military, that it would be nice to remove everything from the college, including the people, and then have the Air Force do a surgical strike and then begin anew. We just, at the time, felt it was very important to tie it together, to also have students who were involved in many different disciplines to all be together in the same campus mixing uh, with one another, getting to know one another, because part of higher education, of course, is your involvement with your peers. Uh, so it, 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 those were the things that we thought of, instead of separate units, having everything coordinated. When we saw the building, at first, we said, what are we getting into? And then, Looking at it, it really modeled Rhode Island's motto, the ship of hope. And it, it does look like a ship. And it did provide hope for many, many thousands of students. Maybe it's not that, it wasn't that eye appealing. But boy, was it functional. And is it functional? You had thousands of students going through here every week. Not much damage, not much wear and tear. <laughs> I love that night campus. Good morning, and this is rather a special morning. For today, September the 11th, 1972, Rhode Island Junior College is about to come to life. For many years, many people have been involved in the development of this campus. And today, as you look around, this huge edifice of concrete, stone, brick, and glass is about to get the prime element, the student. It is about 7.45. The first students are now coming from their cars. And as we, as our camera pans around, you can see the parking lot, which has been empty, is filling. Students are coming from all sections of the state for their first classes at Rhode Island Junior College. Uh, any reaction to what you've seen so far here in, on the Warwick campus? It's altogether different from the CIC complex in Providence, that's for sure. I haven't seen the inside of the building yet, but I'm sure if it's anything like the outside, it's, uh, it's quite a change. I remember coming up the ramp and uh, John Ramirez was out there greeting people. And uh, he's greeting faculty and students. And, you know, we were coming up, we'd been to the building, and his question was, you know. Videotape, I have with me Mrs. Morgan, who is the instructor coordinator for the medical lab assistant program. Uh, Mrs. Morgan, any reactions other than the traffic jam? We know we have one this morning, but that will be worked out uh, uh, within the very near future. Any reactions to the new building? Well, it's beautiful. It's unusual. Uh, it looks good with students in it for a change. I, I am looking forward to working in a modern laboratory as compared to what you had in Providence. Yes, indeed. Very much so. Well, thank you, and have a nice day, Mrs. Morgan. We have moved inside. We have moved inside the Rhode Island Junior College. If this resembles a bridge of a ship, uh, uh, perhaps it should, because I have with me the captain of Rhode Island Junior College, President William F. Flanagan. Thank you, Dean Mamaris. This is a very happy occasion. Obviously, this modern 21st century campus opens today for 3,000 students in a very exciting atmosphere with a very exciting environment. Uh, this college is, of course, uh, devoted, is called the People's College, is devoted to the service of students. And as you walk around this building, you will notice everything is oriented toward the student and toward the practicality of his environment in education. Thank you very much. It is my most pleasant duty and privilege to bring the greetings of the State Board of Regents for Education to all here assembled 
for the dedication of the Knight Campus, the first permanent home of Rhode Island Junior College. When we enter this building, as Dr. Flanagan has, has said, we step into the next century. And it is not only because this structure represents a bold and imaginative architectural response to the needs of a future-oriented institution. We have stepped into the 21st century this afternoon in the sense that what takes place in this building, what goes on in the minds and hearts of the students educated here, will determine the future of our state and our society. The shape of this structure, that of an enormous ship with its huge stacks, dramatizes the fact that our state, our society, our country, the whole human race are traveling together on this small spaceship Earth, that we are all in the same boat. As an essential and integral feature of this building, we have the great portal through which we pass to enter. It is an entrance with neither gate nor barrier. It is an open door. We began with modest budgets and modest quarters. Beside the pollution laboratory of the lordly Wenaskatucket River. But with no modesty of purpose or modesty of vision. And so today you see a 21st century campus that is the architectural response to a curriculum design that includes programs of study that range from philosophy and art and literature to practical skills and marketing practices. From astronomy and speculation and studies of human behavior to programs in firefighting and fire science, nursing and x-ray technology. From transfer programs that have led students from the Ivy League in the East to some 212 senior colleges and universities in the United States and on foreign soil. Such has been our growth, and upon such foundations we justify our past and pledge again the new and expanded resources which our citizens have provided for the unborn tomorrows. That this is going to be a new concept in education, and that this was truly going to be a community college and that the ec educational activity within these halls would merge with the community activity that surrounded the campus. And as I view the development of these programs, I would like to pay tribute to Dr. Flanagan, to his staff, to the teaching profession, to all of the people that operate this fine institution, pay tribute to the regents and all of those who have supported the development of this school because I truly believe that you have accomplished your goal. This in the pure sense of the words is a community college. I remember the success of the Knight Campus and in the early 70s was so tremendous. Um, people were uh, coming around to the campus. They had overflow of students and there was always talk of building more than one campus. And I think the success of the Knight Campus just spurred on uh, E escalated how quickly they were going to do a second campus and the, politically the time was right and um, they found uh, the property and I believe that the time they proposed it till the time they got it approved and funded was very very quick um, and it was remarkable the, the you know, Lincoln back in the early 70s was a, little, was a little out of the way. The enrollment there was through the roof the first, uh, the first year. It was easier to find your way around there but the, the numbering system of how we numbered the rooms, you had to have an orientation. It's, it's basically a three-module building, Flanagan. And if you can keep that in mind and then learn the numbering system, each one of those modules, it really helps. But it takes some getting used to. Well, the Flanagan Campus Fieldhouse, uh, we took some of the same ideas we had here. We had tried to get a pool down here. In fact, there's a pool designed for the, for the, for the Medina Walk, but it, when it came to bid, we didn't have enough, uh, enough money for that. So we incorporated the pool up into the Lincoln Fieldhouse, took care of some of the things we wanted to improve a bit on the Warwick Fieldhouse. We put those into the Lincoln Fieldhouse. When I first arrived there, basically, student services was composed of 
uh, student life. Uh, Archie Goldberg, Lucy Medeiros was the primary catalyst for student life. She had done a lot of work on, on the Lincoln campus as well as the Warwick campus. So there was plenty going on in student life essentially because of Lucy Medeiros. And she's the one that really developed clubs and organizations. She's the one that really uh, developed the process to get student government going. Um, and she had a, a very full agenda of student life activities going for both campuses. I really believe that, that without her, student life would not be what it is even today because I think that many of the things that she put in in those days still exist today. We had planned in the agenda an all-college hour. And early in the history of the community college, that all-college hour existed between 12 and 2 o'clock on Tuesdays. People had plenty of opportunities to see each other because there was a lot of activities that were going on at the, at the Lincoln campus and, and also, also at the Warwick campus. People had a history already because they were starting something new. They were all brought in almost at the same time. Uh, so there was that camaraderie that was built in. A breaking point with President Flanagan was we've had two strikes. And people that surrounded the president at the time convinced him the faculty would not strike. And when they did, he was like a father with a broken heart. It really, really hurt him. After that, things weren't quite the same. He used to come down into the cafeteria, have coffee with people, talk with people, and he, he didn't do that after that. And, and I felt badly for that because it was like his children uh, abandoned him. I think my dad had a couple of reasons why he decided to retire when he retired. Uh, he had personal reasons. Uh, my mom had passed away, and I think he felt that he wanted to spend more time with the kids as they were getting ready to go off to college and, and some of us were a little younger than that. So I think it was very much a personal decision. And I also felt that he thought seeing two colleges built in a really quick period of time, you know, they went from I think 330 students the first year to about 12 or 14,000 when he left. Um, I think he also felt like, hey, it's time. Change is good. Uh, you need new vision for the future and this is a good time to do that. I remember the interviewing process, and I remember um, the number of candidates who were applying for the job to be the new president, the second president of the community college. I think that there were a bunch of folks looking for another Bill Flanagan, and it just, just wasn't out there. I think there was another group of folks who recognized and thought that we really needed some serious changes at, at Rhode Island Junior College, that we needed to move into another generation you know, of the demands of educating folks, developing of programs. And Ed Liston outlined in grand form what community colleges across the country needed to do to meet the needs that are going to occur in the future. And he made it very clear that if community colleges didn't do that, they would not be effective in meeting the needs of those folks that they were going to serve. I remember walking away from that interview saying, you know what, this guy's going to be our next president. President Liston was a businessman. Um, he was articulate. He had tremendous wit. A lot of folks didn't see that, but he did. He had a good sense of humor. He used the business model. He believed in strategic planning. He believed in, in short-term and long-range planning. He brought that idea you know, to, the, to the administration of the Community College of Rhode Island, although we had some idea of what we needed to do. He, he brought it into the fabric of the Community College. He was here for 20, 21 years, so his impact 
was not only felt early on, but it was, it, it was long lasting. He was a pioneer. Dr. Flanagan had to start from scratch and he had to make do with whatever he could get his hands on. But Ed Liston had the luxury of, with some budget, tinkering with the model and improving it. He was the kind of person that would want to meet with his staff almost on a daily basis. He could often be found early in the morning down in the cafeteria surrounded by deans, vice presidents, faculty, every morning. You could always find a member of his senior team or him sitting around having coffee. And it became sort of a tradition in his administration that if you really wanted to see somebody and get work done early in the morning, go down and have a cup of coffee and join up with someone and start talking to the Bob Hendersons of the world. I think Ed Liston attracted a lot of qualified people to work with him in helping the college to broaden and get its roots down. And I think he, he worked real hard at trying to get the right people in the right jobs. Bob Henderson played a major role in the development of what occurred at this college. He was a great financial manager. He had a great mind. Uh, he knew the political fabric of this state. He quickly became Ed Liston's right-hand person. Ed Liston could not have gotten done what he did early on without the help of people like Bob Henderson, Ray Furland, Bob Silvestri, Mona Bromowitz. Um, it just would not have happened. So were there hardships and, 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 and pain in some of the change? Yep, there sure was. Um, was it to be expected? Certainly. Was it planned? It certainly was. And we moved in those directions quite rapidly early on, made significant changes in the first six, seven, eight years of his tenure as president. You didn't have the same um, fatherly leader that we had with Flanagan. It was, it was a different atmosphere. He did uh, write me a letter, and we corresponded once a year, every year. He continued to donate and continued to follow us because his notes were clear to me that he'd been watching what I was up to. It was very meaningful to have that, to have notes from him and letters from him. He really built this institution along with Dr. Flanagan and, and certainly Dr. Seep, um, three presidents before me. And, but Liston was the longest serving president and I think did a, an outstanding job. You know, it really is in a great place today because of him and the leadership. He took us from being Rhode Island Junior College to the Community College of Rhode Island. He became very aware of, of that the impact of how Community College of Rhode Island in those days reject was being referred to. And I think the notion of changing the name not only grew out of a discussion that he had with certain people on campus, but I also think that there was a trend in the United States that looked at community colleges. There are a number of junior colleges still around, but I think that they began to take a look at that concept of community colleges. And so Ed Liston certainly was the catalyst for that change. He did not like RIJC, and I think one of the main reasons that he did not like RIJC was the reference that was made to reject. So he settled that issue, and he, and he, um, he offered the opportunity for us to sit down and discuss name change. The Community College of Rhode Island was one of the first that was mentioned and it just kind of stuck because, because it made sense. After I got the education that I did here, it did bother me that it was known as reject. And um, so I, 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 to me it gave it um, uh, uh, a name that I was proud of. I had a big problem with the name change initially because I thought, why are we doing this? Because <laughs> I, I'm not easy on change. <laughs> so, but I mean, if you make a good case, eventually I'll fall in. And I think President Liston made an excellent case because he said, we go beyond the transfer. He said, we're doing much more than that. And it's true because we have those wonderful certificate programs, the one-year certificate programs in phlebotomy and ra the radiographic technician and so on. And those people go out to get great careers and then they can still go on and get more education do more with that if they like. I wasn't initially, but I moved right into it after it was explained to me well. 
So I think that the change brought relief. I really do. Uh, people, people received it with open, open arms. What it means to me to have CCRI as a Rhode Islander is, um, I think it's, it's an incredible, incredible, important piece of our state's fabric. I don't think we have this type of opportunity for our young people if we don't have these incredible four campuses. The amount of education it's provided, the amount of training, the amount of certification uh, is incredible. It's remarkable. It's an, it's an incredibly, incredibly important piece of this state. And I think it's the most remarkable success story uh, publicly in our state in the last 50 years. When I look at all four presidents, certainly Bill Flanagan was, was the initial part of my life, and, and the longest part of my life it was, with, was with Ed Liston, and then Tom, and now Ray. There are differences between Ray DiPasquale and Bill Flanagan, no question about it. They're, they're presidents at different times in history and with different challenges. I think, though, that there are some similarities. To me, there's only one Dr. Flanagan. <laughs> Although I think the current president, uh, Ray D. Pasquale, reminds me a lot of him. They care about people. They they communicate well with people. They get their point across. They're not shy about telling you what's on their mind. They they are upfront, and um, if they have something to say to you, they'll get on the phone and call you. That's one of the things that I admire most about Ray D. Pasquale right now. There are many things, you know, when I compare all the presidents, if. Out of, out of all four of them, those two stick together, you know, in terms, of, in terms of their similarity and what they've done for the community college. I think both of them were politically astute or are politically astute. And I think the challenges of creating a new community college and, and the kind of political uh, support that, that needed to get that done, Flanagan was very savvy about knowing the people that needed to get that done. Well. Ray DiPasquale has those same challenges. He knows who those people are. He communicates well with those people. Uh, somebody 50 years ago got it right, and, and I think we know who that was, Governor Chafee at the time. He had the vision and the willpower to put this in place. And today it's the largest community college in New England. Um, we have reaffirmed our accreditation, and students have an unbelievable opportunity to really use this to do anything and everything they could ever dream of. So let your dreams live on and let the Community College of Rhode Island help you. At the end, if I had to summarize it, I guess I would say is that we've expanded the walls of the school to really include the community. And as one might say too, it's, it's a real privilege and honor to be the president um, of the school. And, and to be part of it in the 50th year is something that, you know, will be one of my best memories of, of, of all time. I mean, how can it not be? You were here and you were president during the 50th year. So um, between our athletic teams and our, our academics and our stellar faculty and our staff and, and all the great things that the school does, uh, the Community College of Rhode Island after 50 years is, uh, is in a pretty good place. And Rhode Island, is, as well as all of us, should be very proud of its accomplishments. I want to leave you with a more, some more thoughts from Dr. Flanagan whose words he shared 50 years ago at the college's first formal convocation, and they still remain true today. He wrote, and I quote, No one can look to the future without a sense of challenge and an awareness of the great opportunity which this institution holds for the future of higher education in Rhode Island. The opportunities for service to students of our state and to the economy of our state are born consistently in mind as we begin our college life. I will conclude as he did by looking at all of you and saying, may all who are here with us this day catch something of the fire that lights our hearts as we begin.